Uh, I'm Megan Heinz. I'm a senior data scientist on the data products team at Rent the Runway. And today we're going to be talking about SimPy, a discrete event simulator package in Python, and how we used it to launch our newest warehouse in June of this year. The reason I wanted to give this talk is um, I think a lot about what our data science toolkit is. And often I think about it as statistics and hypothesis testing, kind of regression and machine learning, maybe, maybe reinforcement learning, maybe neural networks and NLP. Um, but when we were starting to think about launching this new warehouse, I realized that none of these tools were really going to help solve this problem for us. Um, deep learning and machine learning are really great for uh, solving problems when you have a ton of data, but you're trying to understand like what the process is. So your data is going to help you like learn what your model should be. Um, we were kind of in the opposite situation where we understood our, our process perfectly because our engineers had built our fulfillment system, but we had zero observations because we had not opened our warehouse yet. So that led us to like building out a simulation. And as a data scientist, I didn't really have like a ton of experience in building simulations. And I didn't really know a lot of other people that built a lot of them before. Um, and that's kind of like how we got introduced to SimPy. And you know, maybe that resonates with you, and maybe there are things that you can do at your own company with simulations that you hadn't thought about before. So today we're going to talk about what Rent the Runway is. We have like a pretty unique business model, and I would say the, the first thing you need to know when you're building a simulation is kind of have a conceptual model in your mind of what you're building. We'll talk about why a business like ours would need a simulation engine in order to launch the warehouse. Um, again, another really important thing is when you're building a simulation, you're going to have to kind of understand what questions you're trying to answer before you start building it in order to understand like what level of granularity you need to really focus on. Then we'll talk about discrete event simulation, um, what you might use it for or not use it for, and maybe some examples of things you could do at your own company with it. Um, we'll do a couple of toy examples in SimPy, and then we'll talk about um, how we used our SimPy simulation tool in order to launch our warehouse. Um, one little aside that we're going to start with, which is a little uncomfortable for us, is uh, last month we had a bunch of warehouse issues. And I will just say that a discrete event simulation is really good for understanding your risk profile uh, for like what will happen if you have a bug in your system. Um, but it will not help you, it will not prevent you from like, uh, or it will not predict your like issues. Um, it will be something you're really, really happy to have if there's like a catastrophic failure in your operations and you have to come up with a new plan very, very quickly. Um, so this is a, an image from our warehouse in the middle of the bug. Um, and this is what it looks like now. So everything is back uh, to normal and functioning well. So kind of back to the main topic at hand. Uh, what is Rent the Runway? Um, maybe the women in this audience know what we do, but I would imagine uh, many of you don't. Um, we've been around for about 10 years, and we started out doing uh, rentals of expensive designer dresses, primarily for one-time events. So this would be like you are a bridesmaid in your best friend's wedding, and she wants you to buy a $10,000, no, a $1,000 dress, and you're like, that is not something I really want to do, and you say, hey, can I maybe rent this from Rent the Runway instead? So we call this our reserve business, and primarily people are doing rentals for special events, like a gala or a New Year's Eve uh, party or prom or a wow. wedding. And people are paying per <laughs> rental. They're scheduling this in advance. And then we have a pre predetermined return date that they're sending it back to us. Now, in the last two years, our business has evolved and changed a lot. Um, so many of you may remember when Netflix was not a streaming service, but you got sent a DVD in this little Netflix slip. Um, so like. It comes to you, maybe you don't get around to watching it until next Tuesday. Uh, then you finish it up and you send it back and Netflix sends you a new DVD. We're essentially doing the same thing, but with clothes. So our customers are paying a monthly subscription fee. They get four slots for different pieces of clothing. And instead of it just being for special events, people are renting for workwear or a date or just casual stuff, or maybe they are like renting for a wedding. Um, and people can just order whatever is currently in the warehouse. Uh, we ship it out to them that day, and then they can keep it for however long they want. So they could send it back the same day, they could send it back months later, um, and we're promising them a two-day uh, shipping time turnaround, both to and from. 
So this is kind of like what it looks like on our website. This is what I had rented out last week, just like a fall coat and a sweater because it's getting cold, obviously. A Christian Serrano dress for a wedding I went to. And then just like a little cocktail dress I wore on a date with my husband. You can probably gather that these two businesses have very different operations. Um, first of all, our reservations are not made far in advance. All of our reservations come in on the same day. Uh, we can't ship things out early for cheaper shipping costs. So like if you were renting a wedding dress and we knew we had to get it to you in, on uh, December or something, we could ship it out early to make sure, make sure it got to you. But for our subscription, we've got to send it out by air if you're outside of our two-day ground shipping zone. Um, we also have no known return date. So we don't really know when these uh, pieces of clothing are going to come back to us. So in a nutshell, like forecasting on a SKU level basis for the reserve business is like relatively hard, but forecasting for the unlimited business is extremely difficult. Um, but we're kind of willing to deal with that complexity because this business is growing a lot. Um, it's now the vast majority of our business. People seem to really like it. They don't churn very much from it, and we're really happy with it. But this obviously presents what I would like to call a happy problem for our company. We had one warehouse in New Jersey, but this dramatically growing customer base all across the country. And the map that we're looking at here is the UPS ground uh, shipping zones, so from our New Jersey warehouse. So everyone in the yellow and the brown is in the one and two day shipping zone. So we can like meet our customer promise to them just shipping out in trucks. And everyone else in like green, red, and orange, we have to ship out by air. So that means the shipping costs are a little more expensive uh, for us. Um, but like we have a bigger problem, which is that we're just completely like completely at capacity. So we have a ton of demand for this business, uh, but there's no way for us to ship out all those shipments from this one warehouse. So naturally, what we're going to do is we're going to build a second warehouse. And we decided to build this second warehouse in Texas. So we are theoretically we are expanding our scale so we can ship out more shipments. Um, we're going to have faster returns and delivery for our customers. And we're supposed to be able to reduce our transportation costs. So you might be wondering, um, why do you need to simulate that? It doesn't seem that complicated to build a second warehouse. Um, well, our business is fairly unique. We're different from other retail and e-commerce companies. Because we're renting out our clothing and not just selling it to people, um, it happens that our customers are actually holding most of our inventory at any one point in time. So I can't really go to warehouse one and just fill up a truck and bring it to my second warehouse. Um, I have to accumulate inventory in that warehouse through returns. So the second warehouse is actually going to start out mostly empty. So we have to understand how quickly we can ramp the second <coughs> warehouse up through inventory accumulation. So I'm going to send out to a customer in Des Moines from my New Jersey warehouse this dress, and then she's going to have a Texas return label and send it back to the new Texas warehouse. Uh, but I don't want that inventory to be sitting around <coughs> idle in Texas, so people are still going to have the opportunity to order that. So we've got customer orders coming in and customer orders leaving, and we need to understand how quickly we can fill up this leaky bucket. And that's important to us because what we want to do is we want to ramp this second warehouse and then map each of our customers to a single warehouse. So customers will only be able to see the Texas warehouse, or they'll only be able to see the New Jersey warehouse. Um, another thing that we need to know is like how expensive this is going to be for our shipping during this ramp up process. Say I'm a customer in Oakland, and I order this leather jacket and this floral cocktail dress. If I only have that leather jacket in stock in New Jersey and that floral cocktail dress in stock in Texas, then I'm going to have to double my shipping costs and send out two separate shipments to her. Um, this obviously is like a pretty big financial impact for us, um, but there's kind of a secondary effect to this too, where if people have two different return uh, bags with them, they can speed up their swap rates. So not only is that shipment more expensive, but the customer becomes more expensive in general. So that's kind of like where we realized that we really needed to build a discrete event simulator in order to answer those questions. So discrete event simulation um, needs to primarily be two things. It must be dynamic, so your state variables are changing over time. And it must be discrete, so you have significant changes happening in your system at uh, individual time instances. Um, the nice thing is that it can be deterministic or stochastic. Deterministic being everything in your system is entirely predictable, or stochastic being you have some type of randomness in your system. So 
you might be wondering, like, what can you actually use discrete image simulators for? Say you are working for SpaceX or NASA, and you need to uh, simulate rocket trajectory. This is not something you're going to use discrete event simulators for because you're going to require continuous simulation for that. Um, additionally, there's really no discrete changes your, that are happening in your system except for takeoff. When it comes to dice roll outcomes, theoretically you could use a discrete event simulator to model this system, but it would be kind of be overkill because it's not dynamic. If you're playing crafts at 3 a.m. versus 10 a.m., your outcomes are not really changing um, based on like where you are in that space. Uh, so instead, you would probably focus on building something like a Monte Carlo simulation for this. A thing that people definitely use DESs for is understanding how long it takes to board a plane. So all the major airlines have like employed people to work on figuring out what's the best way for them to board, um, and I guess. There is one astrophysicist who has come up with like the most efficient way to do that. Um, and he says that you should board on either aisle from the window seats in. Um, however, because you want to have uh, as many people putting their bag above, above uh, as you can in parallel. Um, obviously, no one actually does this because it's too difficult to get people to follow this process. Um, but this is a system that's dynamic because seats are filling up over time. It's discrete because each of these customers is getting on the plane and taking a seat. And it's stochastic because people do random things. So maybe you think you might want to do some type of discrete event simulation at your own company. Here's like a couple of examples of how other people use them. Uh, the classic DES example is um, modeling a queue system for customer service. So understanding how many agents do you need uh, to process all the calls coming in without people reneging or leaving your line because it's taking too long. Um, things like designing lines at a supermarket. You might uh, recognize this as the Union Square uh, queue at Whole Foods. Uh, I would bet my firstborn child that Amazon designed a DES before they put this in uh, the Whole Foods. And then another thing might be like simulating car share pickup. So why are we using a uh, discrete event simulator for our own system? Well, we know it's dynamic because the second warehouse is changing over time as our inventory accumulates. We know it's discrete because each customer order is changing the state of our network. Once they've ordered something, I can't fulfill it for someone else. And we can model it either deterministically using our historical orders before the warehouse opened or stochastically with probabilistically generated orders. So this is like kind of the output of our trivial uh, simulation in, Sy in SimPy. So we've got the New Jersey warehouse and the Texas warehouse, and orders are being sent out from these two warehouses, and we're keeping track of how many of them are from Texas, how many are from New Jersey. We're also keeping track of how many of them are normal, as in uh, you, are a, you live in New Jersey, I send your order out from New Jersey, versus a cross shipment, whereas you live in New Jersey, but all the stuff you order is in Texas, and I have to send it from Texas and split being I have to send it out from both warehouses. Um, we used this uh, kind of trivial simulation because we could hand calculate out what the answer should be, and we used it as an acceptance, an acceptance test in our, in, our, in our simulator development. So SimPy is just a open source, Python-based, MIT-licensed uh, package that does discrete event simulation. It's kind of designed around this idea that you can use Python generators to simulate active processes. Um, and all that, the kind of components that you're dealing with in that are your environment, which acts as your clock, your processes, which you just implement as regular Python generators, your events, which act as futures or promises, and resources, which are shared throughout your simulation and used by processes. So the first kind of toy example we're going to do is straight out of the SimPy tutorial. We're just going to simulate this car process, which you're alternately driving and parking for a while, kind of going over in a loop. So what that looks like is our car is going to park for two time periods, and then it's going to drive for three time periods. We can run this simulation, and at any point in time, we know the position of that car. The first thing you're going to have to do is select the SimPy environment that you're going to simulate this in. There's two environments, just <coughs> the regular environment and the real-time environment. Um, you're really only going to use the real-time environment if you have some type of like hardware component that you're simulating or some type of uh, human intervention that's necessary. So most of us are probably going to choose the regular SimPy environment. 
And what this is going to do is going to act as your scheduler and your event loop manager. Uh, the next thing you need to understand is what events you want to simulate in your uh, process. Um, I'll be honest, I'm sure there are people who use SimPy events much more effectively than us, but we realistically only used the SimPy timeout event. And this is the event that's going to, like, uh, use, you're going to use to pass time throughout your simulation. So you're going to yield after some delay has passed. You're going to write out your SimPy process. Just a reminder, we're, we're parking and then we're driving. When we write this out in Python, um, it's just a regular generator, but you pass in your SimPy environment as an argument, and you yield using the SimPy uh, timeout events. So we're just parking for a while, we yield a timeout for that duration, and then we drive for a while and again yield a timeout. We're going to make this a little more complicated and also say that our car needs to be charged before it can start driving. So we're going to um, develop some SimPy resources. Um, here that resource is going to be a battery charging station. Our process is going to request that resource and if it is available it will be yielded and held by our process until it concludes. When the process is done that resource will be released. What that looks like in, in uh, Python is just um, you pass that into your process, you request the battery charging station BCS. If it's yielded then we can continue on to the charging uh, process. And that's really all we need to run our first toy example. We're going to instantiate our SimPy environment. We're going to set up our battery charging station resource. And then we're going to set up four car driving processes and tell, our, tell SimPy to start running our simulation. So we're just hanging out, parked, we're still parking. We're going to start trying to drive. So the first two cars, all the cars right now are requesting charging, but there's only two. So only the first two cars are getting that resource. Then they're ready to start driving. That resource is released, and the second set of cars is able to start charging. And then we can just, like, off to the races, drive to our destination, and that's it. So they're, like, very simple building blocks to run these, like, very simple uh, simulations. The next example is a little, like, closer to my heart as an RTR employee. So we're going to be fulfilling some orders out of our warehouse, and we're making some pretty drastic simplifying assumptions to make this a toy example. We're going to assume that all of our dresses are fungible, so it doesn't matter if you don't like the dress or it doesn't fit you, you're happy with this dress. Uh, all of our customers are keeping their, their items for the same amount of time, and our new orders are being made on a regular cadence. We're going to set up our SimPy resource, which is our dresses. Um, we're just going to give it a number of dresses, and these dresses are going to be used up by our order processes and then released when the order is complete. Then we'll write out our, our order process. Our order is going to request a dress from the warehouse. And if it's available, the warehouse will send that uh, dress out. And then the, it will be um, held at home for the time the customer is using the item. We're going to wrap this up in a setup and set up a bunch, uh, three different orders. And then we're going to add another order uh, at a regular interval. And then we're ready to run our simulation. So initially we're going to run the simulation with only one dress. We're going to run it where people are going to keep them for two days. Um, every three days we're going to get a new order and we're going to run our system for uh, eight days. And pretty obviously this like doesn't work out well for us. We have three orders and only one dress. So we have a bunch of fashion emergencies even at time one. Time two, we're going to still not have our dresses, and we're going to be upset about that. Time three, we're going to get one dress back in the warehouse, and we're able to send out a dress for order two. But order three never gets their dress, and at, order, at time four, we're getting another order in and more fashion emergencies. So we know that this is never going to catch up, and this is like not a feasible uh, amount of dresses to have. Um, small aside, we work in the same building as the Olsen twins, and they are just as cute today as they are in this GIF. <laughs> Um, so now we're going to run our simulation with enough dresses. So we're going to start out with three dresses because we have three orders. We're going to run through that and everything is fine. We have all our orders, we send our dresses, they come back to the warehouse and we're able to send out our, order for our dress for order number four. Um, you might even argue that we have too many dresses at this point because technically we have two days to send the dresses out. So like everyone's happy but we could have been like a little leaner perhaps. Um, Obviously, it's pretty easy to know that if you've got three orders, you're going to need at least three dresses. 
Um, the system that we're working with is obviously a lot more complex than that. Uh, we have inventory that's always changing, both like new dresses that we're getting in, dresses that are deactivated because we've rented them out too many times and they're a little too worn out to keep renting, uh, and then things that people buy. So people have the option to buy the thing, it'll never come back to the warehouse. Um, obviously people are also keeping these items for drastically different times. You could send something out and it doesn't fit them, they send it back the same day, or they could keep it for months. And then our dresses are not fungible. We have many thousands of different types of dresses in many different sizes. Our demand is not stationary, and our shipping time is gonna vary a lot, both by location and method that we use to ship the item. But luckily, it's really not that hard to encode all of that into a Simpy uh, uh, simulation. Simpy is not very um, opinionated about what your simulation is going to be. So like we could like really just write out all of the classes and generators and everything we needed to do to simulate out um, what this was gonna look like for us. And that meant that we could take our historical order data and different strategies that we had about launching this warehouse, run a ton of different simulations, and then measure the outcomes of these, kind of like report back to our stakeholders about how we wanted to do this launch. So this is like part of one day, of the output of one of our simulations. We can see like um, all these like cross shipments and like normal shipments and like Secaucus is still like um, creating tons of shipments. And uh, we can like run this for like several months and understand kind of like what this ramp up process is gonna look like for us. And this was really important for us because we had a bunch of important decisions to make. Um, one of which was defining which regions had access to which warehouse over time. So this kind of like mapping decided um, how we assigned return labels for the dresses and how we assigned like priority depots for the reservations. Um, and we would change these maps over time because this is our major lever for controlling how our inventory accumulates, not just like how much, but what is accumulating. Because these regions have like very different populations, which I can tell you correlates with the number of subscribers there, um, that also have very different uh, style preferences, but all, also different weather patterns. So maybe our programmers in San Francisco are just renting out uh, hoodies, uh, but insurance workers in Chicago have to be a little more formal when they go to work. And then in, Chicago, or in uh, Seattle, they're just getting rained on, they want raincoats. Um, and in Montana, they're like preparing for their like camping trip. And when we started running these simulations, we would see that as you would accumulate this inventory in the second warehouse, the shipments would continue to go up. And that's because uh, the more you have, the, the higher the probability that someone's order is gonna be located in that warehouse. Um, so you might have said like, well maybe you don't know, need a simulation to know this, we just know that we need to have enough inventory there. Um, but the thing that really complicates this for us is actually seasonality. So these are three different pieces of clothing that we carry at Rent the Runway and kind of like demand indexes um, based on the season, uh, season that we're in. So obviously in the summer, this fleece jacket is not something that people are super interested in. You don't really want a fleece jacket when it's 100 degrees outside. Um, in the fall, maybe there's like some warm days and some cold days. So some people are interested in this jacket, but it's not like gangbusters or anything. Like it's not that popular, but in winter it's like one of the most popular SKUs. And then kind of the opposite is happening for this uh, orange uh, sundress. It's super popular in the summer, but absolutely no one wants this in January. So we could have assumed that we keep accumulating inventory and warehouse shipments is gonna continue to go up. Uh, but in reality, what we've accumulated is mostly summer inventory and now it's fall and no one wants a sundress anymore. So the simulator was really helpful for us and it impacted a lot of decisions for our business. Um, a lot about like when do we need to schedule manual inventory transfers and just like uh, kind of fix the issues that happen when you're only accumulating for customer returns. Um, it, did, it impacted a lot of things around labor planning because we need to kind of know how many shipments are coming out of the Texas warehouse so we know how many people to hire and train to work in that warehouse. Um, it impacts buying strategies because there are some things that we just don't have enough to split between two warehouses. We've got to like make adjustments to those strategies. And then obviously finance wants to know uh, what percentage of our shipments are going to be split shipments where um, our shipping costs are going to go up a lot. Uh, the takeaways that I have um, from this project is Simpy is very simple. It's not opinionated. Um, really just gives you a clock and events 
and kind of the framework of like how to develop your processes as Python generators. Uh, what's not, comp not simple is your logic. Um, you're really only building a simulation if you have like a very complicated system to build this into. Um, a thing that was like, I didn't really understand when I started this project was simulation is not optimization. We're not just like setting up a system of linear equations and then finding the optimal solution. Your simulation is only going to know the logic that you encode into it. Um, and you can't just, and it's only going to be able to test the strategies that you want to test. So you're going to be able, be able to use your simulation to come up with a better answer, but it's not strictly an optimization. And kind of a corollary to that is stakeholder management. Um, people kind of might, if you're not like careful with your stakeholders, they're going to think that you're developing a uh, magic eight ball and that you can like magically answer any question that they have based on your simulation. But you're really building it for like specific use cases. So a thing that came up a lot for us is they'd be like, oh, well, how's this going to affect churn? And we're modeling out like how the warehouse sends out uh, shipments, not like how things are churning because we're using historical data. Um, I would also say that you should expect to spend the majority of your time logging and reporting. So we wrote out to uh, dictionaries, different event types. We would then save as JSON and S3 and then make different reports of um, afterwards using pandas and Seaborn and things like that. Um, this is really like where the vast majority of your work is going to be is figuring out how to structure this data well and understand what things you should be uh, paying attention to in your simulation. And then the other thing I would say you absolutely must build an acceptance test. Build something that you know the answer to and make sure that that is working well because you're going to get a lot of requests about how to change your simulation and you want to make sure that you're not breaking anything. Uh, this is the team that worked on this project. Um, Rob Soflowski started it and then in SimPy and then left and then Vitaly and I picked it up. And in June, uh, when we were getting close to launch, we pulled in uh, Dan Turkel to work with us on it. He's not a child, he's an adult man, he just has a child Slack photo. Uh, and then Jorg is our fearless leader who helped a lot with our stakeholder management. Um, if these are kind of interesting problems that you might be interested in working on, please come talk to me afterwards. And that's it. I'm ready to take questions. Hi, thanks. Um, this isn't really a SimPy question, but more from like a business perspective. So, you know, halfway through your your explanation, I was thinking of you know, like uh, the scooters or the bike share things where in the middle of the night they send the vans around to move them around from where they actually collect probabilistically. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> has there been any, or would it make any sense in your scenario to, to have, I don't know, weekly flights that between the two warehouses like transport between what's missing from one but is in the other or something? Yeah, that's what I'm doing right now. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, great question. Perfect intuition. That's exactly what we do. Interesting. And it's like a little more complicated than the bikes, right? Because a bike is a bike, but like this gown is very different from this sweatshirt. And like they're not fungible and they have very different demands and that demand depends on the season. Thank you. Cool, thanks. Um, you talk about like where you would use SimPy for simulations versus something like, um, let's say, a Pi contracts uh, or a solver type of thing where you are looking to optimize something? So I would say you want to use SimPy for simulations when uh, you have something that is you computationally, uh, either it's too complicated to optimize or your system is not well understood enough to uh, define it as a set of linear equations. Like for us, uh, demand for each SKU is changing so rapidly that it was hard for, it's hard for us to like uh, coalesce that down into a set of equations. So I would say optimization works well when you have like a very well understood uh, system that you can like encode that way, but uh, a lot of times the complexity is gonna get out of hand very quickly. Uh, yeah, so my question was about the uh, kind of error function that you guys are trying to uh, improve against. Mm -hmm. It seems like a very uh, sort of like complex problem, and I guess I'm wondering between iterations of your simulation, how do you know that your simulation is actually doing a better job at reducing cost or having a higher fidelity model, whatever that is? Right, and that's really hard because we didn't have two warehouses. So we started out by just trying to simulate out what would happen uh, with one warehouse. So we had like all, all our historical orders and we were like, let's just run our warehouse 
um, starting at a certain point in time and see if we can replicate what actually happened. Um, then we can't really compare to like what, what happened when there are two warehouses because we haven't built it yet. Um, but the function we're kind of like trying to understand is like um, how do we minimize the number of split shipments that we have going out and the number of cross and like understand like what cross shipments are accumulating for us. Um, but it's a good question because it was, it was really hard to actually come up with like what our optimization function was for this. Because uh, initially we talked to our stakeholders and they're like, okay, we want to minimize split shipments and maximize this. And you're like, okay, those two things are completely in opposition to each other and cannot be optimized. Optimized. So a lot of this was really kind of uh, simulating out what we thought was going to happen rather than and like trying to avoid like really big missteps rather than coming up with like an optimal solution. Every now and then some celebrity wears something and everybody has to have it. Do you model that as, do you actually have catastrophic events or is there enough of that churn that that's just more of the same that there's always something going on? Uh, no, we don't really model out like when something is gonna like be extremely popular. Like if, if a skew becomes very popular, what happens is just goes to 100% utilization. And then we just don't have any more of them to rent out. And that's like probably the biggest thing that I'm thinking about in the future is how do we understand when we have an item that's at 100% utilization, how much more of it should we have? Because you might be able to say like, oh, I, I should have 10x this, uh, but maybe it's like, not going to be high in demand next year because the trend is going to go away. Um, or like maybe I only needed like a few more of this and if I, if I had 10x this, like most of that would go un underutilized. Um, so I think that's, that's a great question. It's a really hard problem for us because we have, you know, tens of thousands of SKUs. Or is that a feature or a bug because if everybody can have it, then now what's the big deal? It's like when the store would order 10 Swiss watches and they would purposely only sell, only send seven because now it's exclusive. Yeah, I mean, I think about that because uh, I recognize basically every piece of clothing. So when I walk around New York, I can tell who's a customer. Um, <laughs> and it, there is something about like, oh, I have something that other people don't have. Um, like my, my job as a data scientist is like, make sure everyone has what they want. Uh, but yeah, I think that's like an interesting problem and it's not really solved with a simulator. But like, it's totally interesting to think about. All right, we have time for one more question. Once you have your second warehouse up and running, how do you think about integrating what the actual behavior is into your simulation? So we just finished ramping our warehouses. So now we have like kind of two totally separate systems. Um, so mostly we're thinking about um, where to put the third one rather than uh, simulating out these two different ecosystems. Um, more, more we're thinking about like uh, what someone over here alluded to, these like inventory transfers on this weekly basis. Okay, I think we run out of time. And uh, please give a round of applause to you, Megan. <laughs>